This program is supported by Bank of Commerce, an affiliate of San Miguel Corporation. We think customers. and you're watching Eagle News International. Good evening, CJ. Good evening, Alma. Coming live here at uh, the Philippine Arena. Good evening to everyone joining the broadcast. Here are the top stories tonight. Former Philippine President Benigno Noynoy Aquino, the reserved scion of one of Asia's most famous political families, died today. He was 61. A multi-story apartment block in Florida partially collapsed during Thursday's early hours, sparking a major emergency risk. And Russia is warning of an explosive spread of the Delta coronavirus variant in the country, made worse by a sluggish vaccination campaign, leading to rapidly rising infections and deaths. one of uh, the great acts of art vandalism. In 1715, large chunks of Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Night Watch, were cut off in order to fit the colossal canvas into a new home. Now, for the first time in more than 300 years, visitors to Amsterdam's Ridge Museum can see the painting in its original form, thanks to a stunning reconstruction of the lost a different color and even some of the geometry is a bit different. Former Philippine President Benigno Noynoy Aquino, the reserved scion of one of Asia's most famous political families, died today. He was 61. Aquino, who was in office from 2010 to 2016, was the only son of the late former president, Corazon Aquino, and her assassinated husband, Senator Benigno Ninoy Aquino. Aquino was rushed to the Capitol Medical Center in Manila early Thursday, according to local media. Foreign Secretary Teodoro Loxin tweeted his grief over the death of the Sea Green Incorruptible. He said Aquino was brave under armed attack, wounded in crossfire, indifferent to power and its trappings, and ruled our country with a puzzling coldness, but only because he hid his feelings so well it was thought. He had none. Prior to his death, Noy Noy was reportedly undergoing dialysis for at least five months. He was also suffering from diabetes and lung illness. He had also recently undergone a heart operation. Aquino, who was succeeded by President Duterte, waged an anti-corruption campaign during a term that ushered in key economic reforms. Unusually for the conservative country, Aquino remained a bachelor throughout his life, though had relationships with a number of women. Aquino was born on February 8, 1960, to one of the country's wealthiest land-owning political families. A latecomer to the presidential race in 2010, he declared his candidacy only after his mother's death from cancer the previous year had plunged the country into mourning and demonstrated the power of the family name. He made fighting corruption his mantra, capitalizing on his family's clean reputation and vowed to reduce the poverty, afflicting a third of the population. His administration delivered average annual economic growth of just over 6%, the highest since the 1970s, handing the country investment-grade status, but poverty remained endemic. Aquino, who earned an economics degree from the elite Ateneo de Manila University, was long mocked by opponents as a fortunately surnamed underachiever with no administrative or business experience. They also said he had little to show for the more than a decade he spent as a congressman and senator. But the chain-smoking Aquino blossomed during the election campaign into a confident public speaker and the nation's leading critic of his predecessor, Gloria Arroyo, 
who was arrested for corruption after she left office. Aquino had a bullet lodged in his neck, one of five that struck him when rebel soldiers attacked the presidential palace in 1987 in a coup attempt against his mother that killed three of his bodyguards. Aquino put the Philippines' long-running dispute with China over competing claims to the South China Sea at the top of his foreign policy agenda. And he launched a landmark case with the UN-backed tribunal to challenge Beijing's claims to most of the sea, which ruled in favor of the Philippines. But Beijing rejected that decision. Tributes poured in from abroad the, or from around the world today as countries honored the legacy of former Philippine President Benigno Aquino III. Take a look. British ambassador to the Philippines and uh, to Palau, His Excellency Daniel Cruz said, I'm extremely saddened by the passing of former President Benigno Noinoy Aquino III. My deepest condolences to his loved ones and to the people of the Philippines. The French embassy in Manila, however, said in a tweet, Philippines bilateral relations and the friendship between our two countries reached new heights during the presidency of former president of the Philippines, Benigno Aquino III. We offer deepest condolences to his family, friends, and colleagues, and to the entire Filipino nation. Charge of the affairs, John Law said, on behalf of the U.S. Embassy, I offer our deepest condolences to former President Benigno Aquino III's family and loved ones at this heartbreaking time. We are saddened by President Aquino's passing and will always be thankful for our partnership. The Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs has sent a heartfelt tribute, calling him a great man, leader, and nationalist. The department, led by Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro Luxin Jr., expressed condolences to the Aquino family and recognized the former leader's legacy related to foreign policy and history. The European Union said the EU delegation and flag of European Union family in Manila expressed their condolences to the Aquino family, fond memories of his visit to Brussels in 2014. We mourn a friend who pushed for deepening of our relations. Australian ambassador to the Philippines, His Excellency Stephen J. Robinson, offered their condolences to the family and said they remember fondly his visit or state visit to Australia in 2012 and the legacy of partnership and Bayanihan they shared. Now again, tributes poured in, this time from his peers after the news about his death was announced this morning. Senate President Soto said, no matter what political side you're on, when a former president passes away, the country mourns. His death diminishes us all. Sincerest condolences from the Senate and my family to the family of President Benigno C. Aquino III. Now, Senator Aimee Marcus said, I will always treasure the memories of our long years together as freshmen legislators and members of a tiny opposition. For beyond politics and much public acrimony, I knew Noinoy as a kind and simple soul. He will deeply be missed. Meanwhile, President Duterte on Thursday mourned the death of former President Benigno Noinoy Aquino III. He said, I joined the entire nation in mourning the passing of former President Benigno S. Aquino III, he said in a press statement. The president also extended condolences to Aquino's family, members, friends, and colleagues. I express my deepest sympathies to his siblings, Balsi, Pinky, VL, and Chris, as well as to all his loved ones, friends, and supporters. In this period of sadness, may you take comfort in the knowledge that he is now in a better place with his creator, he added. He also acknowledged the accomplishments he and his family left behind. His memory and his family's legacy of offering their lives for the cause of democracy will forever remain etched in our hearts, he added. Former President Benigno Noinoy Aquino III had been in and out of the hospital even before the COVID-19 outbreak last year. When the virus escalated, his staff left rarely or left rarely left the Aquino's uh, Time Street residence in Quezon City, 
wary about infecting him. Take a look. <laughs> Hinarap niya ang lahat ng investigasyon at akusasyon. Sandigan Bayan, November 2017, Senado noong December 2017, at Kongreso noong February 2018. Because when you enter public service, when you serve with honesty and dignity, and you know you have committed no crimes against the people, hindi ka matatakot magsabi ng upo. Pribado po siyang tao, Bago pa man ang pandemic, nagpaspasok na po siya sa ospital. Nais namin magpasalamat sa lahat ng mga doktor at sa buong medical team na nag-alaga sa kapatid namin. Narandaman namin bilang mga kapatid niya that they did everything to make him comfortable. They became compassionate friends who gave him true respect by valuing and protecting his privacy. Sa lahat ng mga totoong kaibigan niya, na walang palya, walang palya siyang ginadalaw, binetex, pinapadalahan ng pagkain, sinasamahan at sinoprotektahan siya, salamat po. Sa mga madre at pare na malapit sa pamilya namin, na walang sawang pinagdasal ang kanyang pagdaling, salamat din po. Sa tropa niya, kay Ivy, at siguro ang numero uno sa listahan, Si Yoli, na 30 years siyang inalagaan, lahat ng kasama niya sa Times Street na mula nung pandemic, bihirang nag-o-o. Dahil alam nila, delikado para sa kanya. Salamat. Sa mga botante ng 2nd District ng Tarlac, noong 1998, kayo ang unang kumoto sa kanya. Sa inyo siya nagsimula. Three terms ang nabuo niya. So, 14.3 million Filipinos na in 2007 voted for him to become senator and sa 15.2 million Filipinos na nagtiwala sa kanya noong 2010 at binigay ang pinakamalaking karangalan na pwede ipagkaloob sa kahit na sinong Filipino habang buhay namin tatanawin na utang na loob at yung naibigay ninyo sa aming kapatid. Maraming maraming salamat po. It is with profound grief that on behalf of our family, I am confirming that our brother, Benigno, no Eloy S. Aquino III, died peacefully in his sleep. His death certificate pronounced his death at 6.30 a.m. due to renal disease secondary to diabetes. No words can express how broken our hearts are. On uh, Thursday morning, the 61-year-old only son of democracy icons, Ninoy and Cory Aquino, died of renal disease secondary to diabetes, as uh, announced by his elder sister, Pinky Abeliada. Abeliada said the official time of death declared at Capital Medical Center, which is near the Aquino's residence, was 6.30 a.m. She was with sisters of Bali Cruz, BLD, and Chris Aquino, but none of the other three spoke. She also thanked all the doctors and nurses and other medical staff who took care of their brother and the nuns and priests who prayed for his recovery. An ambulance brought Aquino's remains to the Heritage Memorial Park. Pending the result of his COVID-19 test, Abeliada said wake details will follow. QZ 6th the District Representative Kit Belmonte also went to the hospital and was the one who told the media that the body will be taken to heritage. Abeliada said Noy was a very private person whom they oftentimes persuaded to answer back at critics. Most of all, they will remember how he worked tirelessly for the country. In other news, a multi-story apartment block in Florida partially collapsed during Thursday's early hours, sparking a major emergency response. Video footage posted online showed a large portion of the building in the town of Surfside, just north of Miami Beach, reduced to rubble, with the apartment's interiors exposed. Now, it was unclear how many people lived in the building or who had been inside at the time. Some residents were able to walk down the stairs to safety, 
while others had to be rescued from their balconies. At least one person has been confirmed dead, Surfside Mayor Charles Burkett told NBC's Today Show. He also said dogs were helping in the search for survivors, but tragically had not found anyone yet. He said apparently when the building came down, it pancaked. So there's just not a lot of voids that they're finding or seeing from the outside. And he said it was not clear how many people had been inside or why the building collapsed. Miami Beach Police Department said its officers were assisting the town of Surfside at a partial building collapse. Uh, local media said records show the building was built in 1981 and had more than 130 units inside. In other news, Malacanang said the government needs to listen to and believe the experts' findings that the use of face shields is effective in preventing further transmission of the COVID-19 disease in the country. Take a look. Sinabi ng Pangulo na kinakailangan rin magsuot, kinakailangan pa rin magsuot ng face shields, indoors and outdoors, bilang additional layer ng proteksyon sa gitna ng seryosong banta dala ng nakakahawang Delta variant ng COVID-19. Bago ito, sinabi ni Dr. Edsel Salvania ng DOH Technical Advisory Group na mas nakakahawa ang Delta variant kumpara sa original na variant na galing China. Ibig sabihin, nakabase po sa siyensya itong desisyon ni Presidente sa pagsusuot ng face shield. Nagbago ba ho ang presidente ng desisyon? Opo. Dahil ang sabi nga po niya kahapon, eh, yung kanyang nasabi na hindi naman niya talagang uh, ninanais na maging bagong pulisiya, ay bago niya nakuha ang impormasyon sa bagong anyo ng Delta variant. Sabi nga po ni uh, Dr. Fauci, no, siyempre po, ang ating mga posisyon ay depende rin sa pagbabago sa siyensya. At dahil nalaman po natin kung anong anyo nitong Delta strain neto, kailangan mas matindi ang proteksyon na ginagamit natin. Kaugnay nito, mayroong inilabas na IATF resolution nung IATF resolution po nung Disyembre. Pasahin po natin ang nilalaman nito no? at ito po ay epektibo muli. Ito po ang binuhay muli ng ating presidente kahapon. Now, uh, all pay persons are mandated um, to wear full coverage, face shields together with face mask, ear loop mask, indigenous reusable or do-it-yourself mask or other facial protective equipment which can be effectively, which can effectively lessen the transmission of COVID-19 whenever they go out of their residences. Meanwhile, Russia is warning of an explosive spread of the Delta coronavirus variant in the country, made worse by a sluggish vaccination campaign, leading to rapidly rising infections and deaths. Take a look. Что за последнюю неделю, в отличие от предыдущих уже месяцев, у нас возросла смертность от ковида на 21,3%. У нас существует ситуация с ковидом приобрела взрывной характер. Спасибо. Now, Russia today reported more than 20,000 new coronavirus infections and 568 deaths, a peak not seen since January as the country battles a surging outbreak of the Delta variant worsened by a sluggish jab drive. In total, officials reported 20,182 new cases across the country over the past 24 hours, including just over 8,500 infections in Moscow, the epicenter of Russia's outbreak. The Russian capital also recorded 92 deaths, the highest in one day since the start of the pandemic, according to the state-run TASS News Agency. The city's mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, has said the explosion of new cases since mid-June has been spurred by the highly infectious Delta variant first identified in India. It represents 90% of new infections in Moscow. The surge has prompted Sobyanin to introduce a host of measures in the 
Russian capital. From June 28, restaurants will only be allowed to accept patrons who can prove they have been vaccinated, were infected within the previous six months, or provide a recent negative PCR test. In a similar move, the governor of the Krasnodar region, home to Russia's popular Black Sea resort city, Sochi, announced today that starting July 1, hotels will only accept vaccinated guests or those with a negative test. The World Health Organization said that it requires more evidence on coronavirus vaccines in children before it can make any recommendations. The health agency suggested that parents could hold off on vaccinating their children against COVID-19 according to its June guidance. The WHO states that since children tend to experience milder symptoms compared with adults, they are not in urgent need of vaccinations unless they have a pre-existing condition. Instead, vaccines should be prioritized for those with such conditions as well as for older adults and health workers. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was approved by WHO's Strategic Advisory Group of Experts for people aged 12 years and older. The website states, more evidence is needed on the use of the different COVID-19 vaccines in children to be able to make general recommendations on vaccinating children against COVID-19. The WHO, however, encourages vaccinating children for their normal shots to prevent other diseases. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that everyone 12 years and older should get a COVID-19 vaccination to help protect against COVID-19. Now, U.S. health authorities plan to update official guidance about administering mRNA COVID vaccines to adolescents and young adults after finding a likely link to rare cases of heart inflammation. But they say the overall benefits still clearly outweigh the risks. The decision was announced during a meeting of experts convened by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, on Wednesday that reviewed 323 confirmed instances of myocarditis and uh, of uh, pericarditis, the inflammation of the lining surrounding the heart, among people under 30 following vaccination. Fortunately, it's an extraordinarily rare event, and when the event happens, it's generally quite mild, according to Henry Bernstein, a pediatrician at Cohan Children's Medical Center in New York and member of the expert panel, telling this to AFP after their meeting. He added he would continue to strongly advise parents to vaccinate their adolescents. Of the 323 cases, 309 were hospitalized, 295 were discharged, nine remain hospitalized with two in intensive care, and there is no outcome data for five cases. The cases are predominantly among males. Most occur after the second dose, and there are no confirmed deaths. The data is currently Currently, as uh, one of June 11, when more than 50 million doses of both the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines had been administered to people aged 12 to 29 in the U.S. While the case numbers are low, they're still higher than what would be expected in these age groups and researchers are studying possible biological triggers. Israel announced a Wednesday a delay to the renewed entry of individual tourists and said it could take other steps to counter the spread of the Delta variant of coronavirus despite the country's high vaccination rate. Due to concern over the potential spread of the Delta variant, the government has postponed the entry of individual tourists by one month to August 1, the tourism ministry said. Israel will, however, continue to allow in vaccinated tourists in small groups from certain countries after taking two PCR tests and another for antibodies, a ministry spokeswoman told AFP. She said some 600 tourists have visited since Israel launched a pilot program at the end of May. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said Wednesday that if more than 100 new COVID, COVID cases are recorded each day for a week, the wearing of masks indoors will be reinstated. His warning came as Israel registered over 100 new cases 
for a third consecutive day after weeks in which the daily average was between 12 and 2 dozen. Take a look. אני ממליץ, אנחנו, ואני אומר את זה בשם אנשי המקצוע, בואו נחזור, נחבוש מסכות במקומות סגורים. אני מנחה את שרי הממשלה, את מנהיגי הציבור מהרגע הזה במקומות סגורים לחבוש מסכה. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. This portion is brought to you by North Luzon Express Terminal. Samahan si na Wedge Kujamat. Itong balitang panggising sa ulo ng mga balita. Apo David. Sa anim na pong katao ang isinugod sa ospital. TV Publico. Economic sabotage. Ang mga tiwaling negosyante. At Cristel Fesalbon. Pag presyo ng gulay, makakausap natin. Para iatid sa inyo ang mga kaganapan at pangyayari sa bansa at sa iba't ibang panig ng mundo. Mga napapanawang isyo ng bayan. May balitang sports, entertainment at iba pang kaalaman. Simula lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 5 ng umaga sa paborito niyong morning show, Pambansang Almusal, dito sa Net25. Pambansang Almusal Kumanta, sumaya tayong lahat Kaysaya, saya Welcome back. An airstrike on a busy market killed or wounded dozens in Ethiopia's war-torn Tigray region. Survivors and emergency workers said as a seven-month-old conflict surged again. Families rushed to a hospital in the regional capital, Mekele, as the casualties, including many children, arrived from nearby Togoga, where witnesses and medical personnel said a busy marketplace had been bombed on Tuesday. The United Nations called for an urgent investigation into the strike, which has killed and wounded an as yet undetermined number of people. The carnage unfolded as ballot counting was underway across much of the rest of Ethiopia following Monday's national election. But the conflict in Tigray prevented any voting there. The airstrike happened as reports emerge of rebel advances in some parts of the northern region where famine has been reported and atrocities documented. In November, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed sent troops into Tigray promising a swift campaign to oust its dissident ruling party. The alliance against Tigray's renegade leadership followed peace overtures towards Eritrea made by Abiy that ended a long Cold War between the neighbors and earned Abiy the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. In recent days, as votes were cast and counted across much of the vast nation of 110 million people, there were reports of rebel advance in Tigray. The fighting in Tigray and its impact on civilians has damaged Abiy's standing as a peacemaker, and, uh, but his administration has remained defiant in the face of international criticism. Aid groups say that as a result of the fighting, 350,000 people face famine conditions in the northernmost region, an analysis the government disputes. <laughs> On Monday, UN Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet expressed alarm at ongoing atrocities in the region, including sexual violence and extrajudicial killings. Take a look. In the Tigray region of Ethiopia, I'm deeply disturbed by continued reports of serious violation of international humanitarian law and gross human rights violations and abuses against civilians by all parties to the conflict including extrajudicial executions, arbitrary arrests and detentions, sexual violence against children as well as adults, and forced displacement. Alison Lombardo, the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Bureau of International Organization Affairs, said Washington was gravely concerned 
at the violations Shavim committed by Ukraine troops in Tigray. Yani Britain's human rights ambassador in Geneva, Rita French, agreed, insisting that international use of starvation of civilians as a weapon of war is completely unacceptable. Demanding the immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops, she stressed that it is essential that all those responsible for human rights violations and abuses be held to account. That call was echoed by the United States, the European Union, and a long line of other countries. U.S. President Joe Biden laid out new measures to tackle the pandemic of gun violence. In a televised address following a White House meeting with Attorney General Merrick Garland, a bipartisan group of city mayors and law enforcement leaders. Take a look. Today, the department is announcing, as I just did, a major crackdown on stem the flow of guns used to commit violent crimes. It's zero tolerance for gun dealers who willfully violate key existing laws and regulations. Let me repeat, zero tolerance. States and cities should invest in American Rescue Plan funds in those kinds of anti-violent crime programs. And today I'm announcing that the White House will be working with 15 jurisdictions that are doing exactly that, from Baltimore to Baton Rouge to Memphis to Minneapolis, to build up their community violence intervention programs starting this summer. <coughs> and uh, we just met as I said, with a bipartisan group of, uh, of mayors, law enforcement, and community leaders. And we discussed a, a comprehensive strategy that I'm releasing today to uh, combat the epidemic of gun violence and other violent crime that we've been seeing in our country for far too long that has spiked since the start of the pandemic over a year ago. Now, his plan addresses ways stemming the flow of firearms used to commit violence. It also enables jurisdictions to reallocate unspent COVID-19 recovery funds to pay for new police fires or police hires, crime-fighting technology like gunshot detection systems, and expanded efforts to prosecute gun traffickers. President Biden also signaled that authorities would crack down on what he described as merchants of deaths who supply the bulk of weapons used in crimes. Nine of every 10 illegal guns found at crime scenes were sold by just 5% of the nation's gun dealers, he said. And the president announced that the administration would collaborate with 15 cities committed to using leftover pandemic funding, including Los Angeles, Atlanta, Baltimore, and the capital Washington, in anticipation of potential summer spikes in violent crime. The Philippines grounded its entire fleet of Black Hawk helicopters today after one of the new aircraft crashed during a nighttime training flight, killing all six on board. Three pilots and uh, three airmen died when their S-70I went down near the Crow Valley training range north of Manila. Yesterday, Defense Secretary Delphine Lorenzana said, the entire Black Hawk fleet are grounded while the incident is being investigated, according to Lorenzana. The country ordered 16 of the multi-role aircraft from a Polish firm that uh, made them under license from the Sikorsky Division of U.S. Defense Manufacturer Lockheed Martin. Eleven have been delivered since late 2020. The government bought the Blackhawks to replace the Air Force aging fleet of uh, Bell UH-1H helicopters, commonly known as the Huey. Many of them were required as surplus from the United States, Manila's longtime military ally. Lorenzana said the Black Hawk fleet has been used for humanitarian assistance and disaster response, including flying COVID-19 vaccines to remote areas of the archipelago nation. Spanish investigators probed the death of John McAfee, who was found in his prison cell 
after an apparent suicide following a court decision approving his extradition to the U.S. on tax evasion charges. The body of the 75-year-old founder of the antivirus McAfee software was discovered at around 7 p.m. on Wednesday in his cell in the Brian Stu Penitentiary near Barcelona in what a prison service spokeswoman said was a death apparently from suicide. Catalan legal officials confirmed it was McAfee who had been held at the facility since his arrest in early October as he was about to board a flight to Istanbul. His body was taken away by judicial officials who opened an investigation to determine the cause of death, according to a spokeswoman for Catalonia's Justice Ministry, telling this to AFP on Thursday. And according to an indictment filed in a U.S. court, McAfee was alleged to have deliberately failed to file tax returns between 2014 and 2018, despite earning millions from consulting work, cryptocurrencies, and selling the rights to his life story. If convicted, he could have faced up to 30 years in prison. According to the U.S. extradition request filed in November and quoted in ruling, McAfee earned more more than 10 million euros in 2014 to 2018, but never filed a tax return. To conceal his income and assets from the Internal Revenue Service, the defendant ordered part of his income to be paid to straw men and placed property in their names. It said McAfee in 1987 founded the computer security software company and ran it for seven years before resigning. His life after that became a headline-grabbing mix of controversies involving drugs, weapons, and even murder. McAfee had more than one million followers on Twitter where he described himself as a lover of women, adventure, and mystery. In a tweet on June 16, he said the U.S. authorities believed he had hidden crypto. He said, I wish I did. My remaining assets are all seized. My friends evaporated through fear of association. I have nothing, yet I regret nothing, he said. From a political perspective, he advocated for ramping up defenses against cyber attacks from China and Russia and ending the war on drugs. Eagle News will be back with more stories. Bank of Commerce. What we are is personal banking, where we understand that every deposit is your hard-earned money. Every loan is for good reason. Every service aids in your convenience. Every business of ours is meant to grow yours. We hear you, feel you, and we act on your every banking need. Bank of Commerce, an affiliate of San Miguel Corporation. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back to the news. Small businesses, which make up more than half of the global workforce, were 2.5 times more likely to go under than larger firms in the first month. So COVID-19, according to the International Trade Center or ITC, warning that the impact of climate change could cause pandemic scale disruption every decade. Take a look. The pandemic has shown that the resilience of businesses matter. It also laid bare a resilience divide between small and large firms. Developed countries have the financial means to sustain their economies and protect the most vulnerable. But most developing and least developed countries are unable to do the same. If such resilience was necessary during the pandemic, it will be even more crucial in addressing climate change. 
the economic disruption of climate change is expected to be like that of COVID-19 size pandemic happening every decade. Going green is a survival imperative. The longer firms take to act, the higher costs become. We need to learn from COVID in order to increase the resilience of small firms. So what have we learned? Our SMECO from last year showed that two out of three micro and small firms were strongly affected by the pandemic. And that's compared to half of large firms. We know that. We also know that one in four micro firms were at risk of shutting down within three months. And this is compared to one in 10 large firms. This matters because we found that companies that were resilient to this crisis were five times less likely to fire employees during the crisis. Five times less likely. And if you add to that the fact that SMEs employ a large share of the world's population, their resilience really does matter. During the pandemic, the liquidity of banks, especially in the Caribbean, was upwards of 9 billion. But somehow they lack the capacity to attribute value to the green transition process and what this will mean. And so it's also important for BSOs and governments to advocate with the financial institutions to help them understand the long-term strategy and the need to invest and allow this kind of um, you know, support to come into effect. To help uh, small businesses rebuild from the pandemic and prepare for the climate crisis while becoming more competitive, Coke Hamilton maintained that urged they uh, will need uh, the support of a network of private and public partners to boost their means to withstand future shocks. According to ITC, nearly 60% of African companies that invested in greening their enterprise said that this led to new, higher quality and more products. Access to new markets was also a byproduct of this investment along with lower costs. Meanwhile, economists forecast the Banco Central ng Pilipinas to keep key rates steady this year to help lift the domestic economy and reduce bank's reserve requirement ratio, or RRR, once inflation stabilizes. In a report released after the central bank announced that its policymaking monetary board maintained the key rates for the fifth consecutive rate-setting meet or since November 2020, ING Bank Manila senior economist Nicolas Mapa cited BSP Governor Benjamin Diokno's statement about monetary authorities' willingness to provide policy support for as long as needed. He said with price pressures fading and inflation set to slide back within target in the coming months, we expect BSP to extend its pause for the balance of the year with a possible rate hike by the middle of next year. Last year, the MB slashed BSP's key policy rates by a total of 200 basis points to help lift the domestic economy from the impact of the virus-induced pandemic. Now, diners in Israel are tucking into laboratory-grown meat that scientists claim is an environmentally friendly way to feed the world's growing population. Meat demand is supposed to double itself in the next couple of decades and we are going to need more technologies, more infrastructure to produce more and more meat. Uh, additionally, this is a very sustainable uh, production process. As you can see, this is a very small area and we are able to produce hundreds of kilograms on a weekly basis here. And, and this way we'll be able to reduce the amount of land, water use and so many other resources. Oh, 
if I can get that at a restaurant, I will go vegan. Yeah. Totally. It's a game changer. Mind blowing. It was seriously overwhelming. I like becoming vegetarian. I knew that I would have to sacrifice something that I really loved, which was meat. And I never thought that I would try it again. So tasting it now for the first time, I didn't know what I would feel. And it was amazing. <laughs> like I'm so happy right now. <laughs> Brazil's controversial environment minister Ricardo Salles announced his resignation just over a month after the Supreme Court ordered an investigation into allegations he was involved in a timber trafficking scheme. Salles, one of the most divisive figures in far-right president Jair Bolsonaro's government, has presided over a surge in deforestation in the Amazon rainforest and major cuts to environmental protection programs since taking office in January. January 2019. The minister had faced even greater scrutiny since May 19 when a Supreme Court justice ordered an investigation into allegations that he and top officials in his ministry helped companies traffic illegally logged rainforest wood to Europe and the United States. Police raided his home and environment ministry offices the same day. He will be replaced by his secretary for the Amazon, Joaquim Alvaro. Pereira Leite. The destruction of the Amazon, a vital resource for curbing climate change, has accelerated in Brazil since Bolsonaro and Salles took office in 2019. Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon surged by 85 percent in the administration's first year, destroying an area bigger than Puerto Rico, according to government data. Sports now. Brooklyn Nets forward Kevin Durant will compete for a third Olympic title in Tokyo alongside a new group of NBA stars taking gold, according to an ESPN report yesterday. A story on the U.S. based sports television network's website said Durant, whose team was eliminated by Milwaukee in the second round of the NBA playoffs will be the only player returning from the 2016 Rio champions. UA, USA Basketball finalized its uh, roster on a Wednesday with commitments from Chicago Bulls guard Zach Levine and Detroit Pistons forward Jeremy Grant, according to the story. Nets star guard uh, James Harden was forced to skip the Olympics due to a hamstring injury, USA Basketball Managing Director Jerry Colangelo told ESPN. Those making their Olympic debut will include Portland's Damian Lillard, Washington's Bradley Beal, Miami's Bam Adebayo, Boston's Jason Tatum, and Golden State's Raymond Green. The lineup reportedly also included Cleveland forward Kevin Love, who helped the U.S. to gold in London in 2012. Three other players on the reported roster remain in the NBA playoffs. Phoenix swingman Devin Booker and Milwaukee box forward Chris Middleton and guard Drew Holiday. Now, it's one of the great acts of art, vandalism. In 1715, large chunks of Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Night Watch, were cut off in order to fit the colossal canvas into a new home. Now, for the first time in more than 300 years, visitors to Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum can see the painting in its original form thanks to a stunning reconstruction of the lost pieces. Take a look. The Night Watch was painted for, let's say, the clubhouse of the Civic Guards. Um, after 70 years, it was moved to the town hall, and there it had to fit in between two doors. It didn't fit. 
so the people who moved it decided to to cut it and really took scissors and just cut on all four sides they cut a strip of it and that's 300 about 300 years ago um, and what we wanted to do and the research that we're doing is is it possible to make a reconstruction of how it looked in the original um, we've done that on small images, but it's very different to see it really next to the real Nightwatch. So we have a small copy that was made before the Nightwatch had its sides cut off. Um, this is by Herod London's, and it's less than 20% of full scale. So this is the most reliable information we have about what the missing parts looked like. So the goal is to take this and to use it to make the reconstruction of all four sides that were cut off. Uh, but the problem is that the painting is by a different painter, it's in a different style, it has a different color, and even some of the geometry is a bit different. So if we were to simply blow this up and put it next to the night watch, it wouldn't match in any way. So to help it match, um, I've trained three separate neural networks to help uh, with this process. So that's a kind of artificial intelligence in which we... Now, based on a small 17th century copy of the Night Watch, scientists used artificial intelligence to recreate the missing sections which have been printed and mounted around the framed, the famed artwork. The reconstruction has revealed the true dynamism of Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's original composition with the two key people at the center of the painting, Captain Franz Bannock and Koch and Lieutenant Willem van Reitenberg now offset to the side according to Dibbets. The lost figures of two men and a small boy have meanwhile been restored to the left-hand side where a 60-centimeter strip was cut off the painting which even in its smaller form measures a huge 3.79 meters by 4.36 meters. Now the uh, Rijks Museum, which recently reopened after the relaxation of the coronavirus measures, will keep the panels in place for three months as part of a huge restoration of the painting launched in 2019. The Rijks scale. Museum, which so recently reopened, will uh, keep the panels in place for three months. And to use it to make the reconstruction of all four sides that were cut off. Uh, but the problem is that the painting is... It must have been a very difficult decision back then and uh, would have been a much more difficult decision to cut up that uh, artwork now. Well, that's it for tonight's broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us again live here at the Philippine Arena. I am CJ Hero. Please join us again tomorrow. And at the end of the day, we'll see you back tomorrow. There remains so much more to be grateful for. I'm Alma Angeles and we, we live... live an interesting time. This program is supported by Bank of Commerce, an affiliate of San Miguel Corporation. We think customers. Factual. We have to defeat the virus everywhere. Timely information. Balanced. Not only in the country, but also abroad. I'm certain of one thing. Interviews that people need to know. Watch Aguila Pilipinas. A one-hour newscast of reports coming from regional hubs in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Know the important updates in Asia in ASEAN in Focus. Track the